What's the integral of e to the minus x squared when evaluated from minus infinity to infinity? If you want, you can pause this video here and get out a piece of paper and try to actually evaluate the integral. But if you don't want to, then just carry on watching the video. Now, normally when you're finding definite integrals, when you have an integration which has got a range you have to integrate over, what you'll usually do is you'll just find the indefinite integral of that function and then plug the numbers in as appropriate, then subtract them with each other. However, for this particular problem, trying to find the indefinite integral of this function and then hence the definite integral is probably not the best way for you to go about trying to solve the problem because the indefinite integral for this problem is actually rather complicated. Now, if you try asking Wolfram Alpha what the indefinite integral of e to the power of minus x squared equals to, it will give you some answers in terms of what we call the error function. Now this error function, as we call it in mathematics, is a non-elementary function, meaning that it can't be described simply in terms of mathematical operations that you're probably already familiar with. Now the error function can be found, however it's just so complicated that we're probably better off trying to solve this problem using a different method. So before we even try to go in and evaluate the integral, let's actually look at what the function looks like when it's plotted out on a graph. Now the plotted graph might ring a bell for some of you because it does look like the normal distribution curve. In fact, the graph doesn't just look like the normal distribution curve, it is actually the normal distribution curve. But enough about the normal distribution. How do we evaluate this integral? Well, in order to help us find what i is, we're gonna be looking at a very similar integral. Now, how are these two integrals actually similar to each other? Well, let's carefully look at this particular integral here. Now look at this particular function, e to the power of minus x squared plus y squared. You can rewrite this topic as e to the power of minus x squared minus y squared, and because of indices rule, you can actually split this into e to the power of minus x squared times e to the power of minus y squared. Now let's look at the first integral, which is with respect to y. And because it's with respect to y, this bit, the e to the power of minus x squared bit, is not actually going to affect the integral in any way because it's with respect to x. And so we might as well just take this bit as a constant and take it outside the integral. And then we're left with this definite integral, which can be evaluated somehow and get out an answer as a number, as a constant. And then if we put the other integral back in, we can also try to evaluate this integral. But because this bit here is actually just a constant, we can move this bit outside and then all we're left with is this integral. And so what we have earlier now just reduces to two integrals multiplying with each other. The first integral will just equal to i as we defined earlier. And the second integral in fact also equals to i because it's actually just the same integral. But instead of writing it in terms of x, we're writing everything in terms of y instead. And so now what we have is that this integral equals to i squared or whatever the answer to the integral we're interested in at first squared. And so in order to find the answer to the integral that we're interested in, all we have to do is just try to find the answer to this integral and then square root it. But what's the integral of this function? It looks much more complicated. Why am I bringing this up? Well, first, let's actually try to see how the function looks like. If I plot it out, you'll get a 3D curve, basically a 3D bell-shaped curve. And what we're doing in this particular integral is we're trying to find the volume underneath the curve here. Similar how to when you have a single integral, you're trying to find the area under the curve, a double integral means you're trying to find the volume under the curve. But the way that we're going to be finding the volume under this particular curve is rather interesting, so stay tuned. First, let's look back at the function again e to the power of minus x squared plus y squared. But what is x squared plus y squared? If you draw out the equation x squared plus y squared equals to r squared on an xy plane, you'll see that what you get is you'll get an equation for a circle with a radius r. Every point on this curve will all be a distance r away from the origin. So now let's go back to the function that we have earlier. I'll replace x squared plus y squared with 
r squared. And now we have a function that looks much more interesting. Instead of having a function which just depends on x and y, we now have a function which instead depends on r, which is just the distance that the point is away from the z-axis. And with the equation in this form, we can see that this graph actually has got some sort of a radial symmetry. You can rotate this graph, however, about the z-axis and it will still look the same. And this particular property will help us a lot when trying to find the volume under this graph. So well, how can we actually find the volume under this particular graph? Well, what we can do is we can try to break this volume down into much simpler shapes which we can actually work with and we should try to pick shapes which also have this sort of radial symmetry similar to the graph that we already have so let's pick cylinders or more specifically hollow cylinders or just tubes so what we can try to do is we can try to fit these tubes underneath the graph within the volume that we're interested in. And then we can try to find the volume of these individual tubes, sum them all up, and then be able to get the volume that we're interested in. But using tubes which are too thick will leave these particular volumes uncovered. So what we need to do in order to get a proper accurate answer is to use tubes with really, really thin walls. And we would need lots of these. In fact, for us to be able to find this particular volume accurately, we need an infinite number of tubes whose thickness is infinitesimally small. So now let's say underneath the graph we have an infinite number of concentric tubes, each with radii varying from zero all the way to infinity. So now what we can do is we can try to find the volume of these individual tubes and then hence be able to find the volume of the entire thing. So let's just take out an individual tube and try to find its volume. But let's make things a bit simpler. Rather than thinking of this as a tube, let's get a scissor and cut this up like this. So now rather than having a tube we have to deal with, all we have is just some sort of a strip of paper which we have to find the volume of. The height of these tubes is simple, it's just whatever the function equals to. So basically in this case, it will just be e to the power of minus r squared. Now the length of this volume. Well, because this volume before used to be a cylinder, the length of this volume would just be whatever the circumference of that particular cylinder is. So for this case, it will just be two pi r. Now what about the thickness of this particular volume? Well, let's go back to the picture of the tube in beginning. The thickness of the tube will just equal to whatever this length is minus whatever this length is. This length will just be r, whereas this length will just be r plus a little bit more, which I'll call dr. And so the thickness will just simply be dr, a really, really small distance. And so we multiply all of these three things together, we'll get that the volume of each of these tubes equals to e to the power of minus r squared times 2 pi r times dr. And since we have an infinite number of tubes with varying radii from zero all the way to infinity, we need to perform an infinite sum of these tubes or perform an integral for this particular volume going from zero all the way to infinity. And so now trying to find the volume under this graph is just as simple as trying to evaluate this integral, which is very doable if you know a bit of substitution. We can let u equal to r squared so that du equals to 2r dr, substitute things as appropriate, cancel a few things out, then get an integral which can be evaluated and then find the answer to this integral and if we do all this process we'll get the answer out of pi. And so now we have the answer to the volume underneath this graph which means we have the answer to this integral. And because this integral equals to i squared, we can finally find what i equals to, which is just the square root of pi, meaning that we have the final answer to the very problem that I proposed at the very beginning, like quite a bit ago. The integral of e to the minus x squared from minus infinity to infinity will equal to the square root of 
pi. Now the integral here that we've just solved does have a special name and it's called the Gaussian integral. And this Gaussian integral can be seen quite a lot too, all across mathematics and physics. As you've seen earlier, we'll come across this Gaussian integral when we're working with normal distributions. And being able to evaluate this Gaussian integral is important when we're trying to normalize the equation for the normal distribution. But anyways, is all I have time for. Thank you very much for watching this video and I'll see you again very soon. Goodbye.